Well, good morning, Faith Baptist Church. Thank you for being here this morning. It is my distinct honor and privilege to preach to you this morning in the absence of Pastor Roy. So if you will, turn with me to Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to take a look at the incomparable Christ. We just sang about how Christ is incomparable, and that's so true. You know, in every organization, there is one person who stands above everybody else. Uh, if it's a small business, it's, it's the owner, right? He owns it. He calls all the shots. If it's a larger company, maybe they have a president or a CEO, but there's one person who is above the rest. Now, at, at my workplace... I'm a senior quality tech, but I have a supervisor, the quality supervisor. And that quality supervisor has a boss too, the quality director. Now, we're getting pretty high up in the company. The quality director doesn't have to answer to too many people. He might work with the other managers within the company, uh, but as far as people he has to give an answer to, there's not many, but there is one person that the quality director even has to answer to, and that's the president of our company. His name is Tom, and Tom does not ask anybody to do anything. He tells them what to do, and they have to do it because he is at the top. In our company, Tom is preeminent. He is first above the rest. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at someone else who is preeminent, but he's not just preeminent over a company or over a country, but he is preeminent over all of creation. And it's no surprise, his name is Jesus, right? So if you will, uh, we'll be looking in Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to see this preeminent one, and we're going to see that he is the king. He's not just any king. He is the king of kings, as we just got done singing. And his kingdom has no end. In our passage this morning, we're seeing a letter that Paul written to the church of Colossae. He's actually hoping that they would share the letter with the church at Laodicea. And the church here in Colossae was not a church that Paul had visited before. He says they hadn't seen him face to face. Paul visited many churches in Asia Minor, which is where Colossae was, but most of those cities were along the coastline. That's where people lived and gathered. That's where the sea trade was. And so he wanted to write a letter to the Colossians uh, because of the faith of theirs that he had heard um, and what God was doing there in that city. And so he wanted to write a letter to Colossae so that they would be uh, complete, that they would have the assurance of the full word of God. And that's just the heart that Paul had for them. It didn't matter that he had never seen them before, but they were believers. They were brothers and sisters in Christ, and so he had a heart for them. And so Paul begins his letter, as was customary of him to do, with a thanksgiving and prayer. And we see in um, verse 3, he gives thanks to the Father. In, in this introductory prayer and thanksgiving, he's just thanking the Father for the faith of these men and women. Um, and when it gets to verse 12, he is thanking the Father finally for qualifying us to be saints. The word qualifying means to be made acceptable. And we are qualified to be saints in light. And so if you will, please stand if you are able for the reading and honoring of God's word. We're going to see about this kingdom of light. And the word of God says, beginning in verse 13, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, 
the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Let us bow for a word of prayer. Dear Lord God and Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to just as Paul. We are thankful for the grace that you have poured out on us. That same gospel that they heard and believed and trusted in, we have heard and believed and trusted in. That you sent your son to die for us so that we might be forgiven and have eternal life. We are so thankful, Lord. And I pray that we would see your son as the preeminent one over all creation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, in verse, 10, if you, verse 13, if you will, take a look with me again. Paul says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. Here, Paul is speaking about the Father. The Father has delivered us by sending his Son. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. This domain is a power, it's an authority, and we have been rescued from this power, and the head of this power is Satan. We see that in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, it says the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. But notice there's not two kingdoms. Paul doesn't say he rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his son. Rescued us from the power, from the domain of darkness, but we've been transferred into the kingdom of the son. Only Jesus is a king. Satan is not a king. He might be in power over the world right now, but he's a usurper. Satan is a murderer and a liar. And while God allows him to have a little power over the world now, that it is only by God's acceptance and approval that Satan has any power over the world. Remember, God is sovereign. That means he's in complete control of the world. Sometimes God glorifies himself by the, uh, you know, the great miracles that he performs, not the least of which is in salvation. But th- sometimes he glorifies himself in the destruction and judgment of sin. And so with Satan, God will glorify himself with the judgment of Satan and his kingdom, his, his domain of darkness. But in verse 14, we're going to see the way that we can enter into this kingdom. We know that the, the king has a kingdom, and this kingdom overcomes the darkness. But we're also going to see the citizenship in this kingdom requires redemption from the king. Look again in verse 14. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This king is unlike any other king that we know about. The, the people in Colossae would know all about kings. At this time, this was the time of the Roman Empire, and you had Caesar. 
And it's not uncommon for a king to ask his subjects to possibly die for him. He commands them to go out to war and fight his battles. That's a common thing. That's exactly what Israel wanted in their king. Whenever they asked Samuel, they wanted a king who would go out and fight our battles for us. But this king is different in the fact that he doesn't require us to fight for him. Instead, he fought the battle for us. He died for his subjects. Usually it's the other way around. And I want to tell you, if you have been saved by the blood of Christ, if you believe in the person and work of Jesus, you are a citizen of this kingdom of light. And just as in uh, Pastor Roy's sermon series through Ephesians, we've learned that there's nothing we can do to earn this citizenship. It is completely a work and grace of Jesus. It's We are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. But Jesus' kingdom is a kingdom of light. We are not workers of darkness anymore, but workers of light. If you recall in Ephesians 2, immediately after verses 8 and 9, where it tells us that we're saved by grace, Paul says, we are God's workmanship created unto good works. We aren't saved by good works. We're actually saved to do good works. We're saved to glorify God. And those good works are a sign that we have been saved. And so Jesus' kingdom is characterized by righteousness. The hypocritical Pharisees in Jesus' life, they thought they were part of the kingdom of God because they were children of Abraham. They were of the bloodline of Abraham. In John chapter 8, they tell Jesus, you know, we're, we're not slaves, we're not prisoners, we're children of Abraham. They actually say that we're children of God. But Jesus tells them, if you were children of Abraham you would do the works that Abraham did. You want to kill me, not because I did anything wrong, but because I'm saying the right things, because I do the right things and I know the truth. Abraham didn't do that. If you were children of God, you would do the righteousness of God. But instead, Jesus tells them, you are children of your father, the devil. And he is a liar and a murderer, and Jesus knew their hearts. And so in order for us to be confident in our citizenship in this kingdom, we must evaluate our lives and see if we are walking in the truth. Is your life characterized by good works, not because it earns you any kind of salvation, but purely because of the the gratitude of your Savior and the work that he is continuing to do in us as we mature as believers. Not only do we see the kingdom of the king, I want us to take a look at the characteristics of the king. In our next section, we see that Jesus is the image of God. Look in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. It doesn't get any clearer than that. Now, back in Genesis, we read about the image of God during the creation event in Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis 1, 27 and 28, uh, the Bible says, So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over all the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every living thing. Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. They had the image of God stamped on them. And along with that image came authority to have dominion over the whole earth. That's what the image of God does. It has dominion. 
but that image was marred by sin. Adam and Eve were deceived by the serpent in the garden, and they ate of the forbidden fruit. And through that, mankind fell into sin. And so that image of God was marred. But God's grace, he determined to restore that image. And so he made a promise. He made a covenant with Adam and Eve. And through that covenant, there was a sacrifice. God sacrificed animals and actually made clothing for them because they were naked and they were ashamed. And so through a series of covenants, God's plan throughout history was to restore the image of God to man. With Noah, we see a covenant after the flood. God promised to never destroy the earth with a flood again. And the first thing Noah did when he got out of the ark was he sacrificed to God. With Moses, God made a covenant and established the law and the sacrificial system, the priesthood, which they would continually offer sacrifices for their sins. And indeed, in the New Testament, Jesus ushers in a new covenant. And this covenant is unlike the previous covenants. The Mosaic covenant, the priests would have to yearly offer up sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. I'm sure if you've been going through the 90-day Bible reading plan, it gets tedious reading over and over all the different ways in which they had to sacrifice, but it was grace that they're even given an option to do that. But Jesus' sacrifice was once for all. As Jason has been going through the series in Hebrews, we see Jesus as our high priest and king, and his sacrifice is actually sufficient so that no other sacrifice is necessary. And Jesus is also different in that he doesn't just possess the image of God. The text this morning tells us he is the image of God. He is the exact image of God, the invisible God. And the next characteristic we see is that Jesus is the firstborn over creation. Look again, starting in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in all things, in him all things hold together. You know, some people, such as Jehovah Witnesses, they see this, this first verse, uh, that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And they see, they say, look, Jesus was created. He's the firstborn. But that's not what it means. All you have to do is look at the very next verse. For by him all things were created. Jesus created all things. He was not a created being. Jesus is God. Therefore, he is over all things. The, the word firstborn is a legal term. The firstborn of the family was entitled to a double portion of the inheritance. And they were also responsible as the head of the family. They were the representative of the family. So how could... Jehovah Witnesses get that mixed up when they see that he created all things. They actually insert a word into the text. Their text says he created all other things. The problem is there's not a single manuscript in existence that has the word other. There's a lot of textual variants in the Bible. Sometimes it might say Jesus other manuscripts, it says Lord. That doesn't shake my faith. I believe Jesus is Lord. 
But in this instance, there is not a single manuscript. The thousands of Greek manuscripts, the ten thousands of Latin manuscripts, there's not a single one that say he created all other things. They actually believe Jesus was created first and then he created everything else. No, Jesus is not a created being. Jesus is God. He is the image of God, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. Jesus is the ruler of the world. He is ruler over all creation because he created everything. He created it. That means he owns it. And if he owns it, he gets to make the rules. He gets to say what is good and what is bad. And that's why so many people deny his rulership because they don't like his standard of righteousness because they love their sin. And the last characteristic I want us to see is that Jesus is the head of the church. Look again in verses 18 and 19. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Not only is Jesus the king of this kingdom, he is the great high priest. He is the head of the church. Only in, in one place in the Bible do we see someone who is both a king and a high priest, and that's Melchizedek in Genesis, who was a, a type of Christ. He was the king of Salem. He's the king of peace, and his name is the king of righteousness. You know, there's some people who try to venerate Mary, the mother of Jesus, so much so that they say, yes, Jesus is the head of the church, but Mary is the neck that turns the head. The text doesn't say that at all. It makes it very clear. Jesus is the head of the church. He does not share his position with anyone he is the beginning, and he purchased this church with his own blood. Nobody else did that for you. Jesus did that for you, and Jesus alone. Why did he do this? So that in everything he might be preeminent. I want to ask you today, is Jesus preeminent in your life? When you pray, do you say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done? Or do you say, Lord, not thy will, mine be done? That's the difference. When your coworkers see you at work, do they see Christ in you? Do they even have to ask if you're a Christian or not? I have a story to tell you. Years ago, uh, I had felt the calling to become a preacher, and it scared me. I didn't want to do it. And so, like so many others, like in the Bible, we see Jonah. Jonah ran away from God and, and because of his calling. He didn't want to go to Nineveh and preach because he knew God would turn their hearts and, and they would repent and trust in God. And I was just so scared of the calling I ran from God, and I was as successful as Jonah. I didn't get swallowed by a whale, but I stopped reading my Bible because every time I read my Bible, I was reminded of what I wasn't doing, and I stopped going to church because every time I went to church, I was reminded of what I was not doing. And during this kind of Jonah phase of my life, I had this job, and I was working and my coworkers had a conversation, and they actually kind of bashed Christianity and Jesus. And I said, hold, hold on, guys. I'm a Christian. You know, don't say those things. I'm a Christian. They looked at me, and they said, no, you're not. 
let me tell you, it was like a dagger right to my heart. Because I knew I was not living the way I ought to. I was not representing Christ. So that these unbelieving people could not see Christ in me. And I knew that I needed to repent and obey God's calling for my life. This is called the sin of omission. You know, some sins we do, we commit them. They're called sins of commission. When we lie, when we steal, when we blaspheme God, those are things that we commit. But there's other sins that they're not things that we do. Rather, it's sins that they're things that we fail to do, things that we're supposed to do. The Ten Commandments has those things also. We're, you know, we're to love God, we're to honor our parents. If we fail to do that, we commit sins of omission. And in James chapter 4, verse 17, James says, Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. And I can stand here today and tell you there's not a single person at my workplace that is unsure about my faith in Christ. But I can only say that by God's grace. We must make Jesus preeminent in our lives. We can't just come to church on Sunday morning and then Monday through Saturday live exactly like the world. He must be first place in our life. In fact, he must be so preeminent that everything else fades away. You recall the sins of Israel wasn't that they didn't worship God, but they had a form of syncretism where they thought, maybe I can worship God and I can also worship the Baals and Astra and the the gods of the surrounding nations. And they were judged harshly because of that. And so many people today think, I can can worship God, but, you know, I can kind of worship myself too. Uh, I don't need to... Uh, make Christ first in my life. And it's a struggle. It's something we all have to do. Every single day, we have to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. We need to daily put to death sin in our life. There is a struggle. Some people have asked me, Jeremy, I don't know if I'm saved because It's just always a struggle and a battle with sin. Sometimes I win, sometimes I lose. And I say, I can't see your heart, but I can tell you this. If you weren't saved, there wouldn't be a struggle. You would just sin. That's what comes naturally to sinners. You're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. But God has given us everything that we need to overcome sin in our life. We don't have to... Uh, fail at that sin. Everyone's got that sin that just nags at us. It's like a ball that's chained to our foot. But through faith in Christ, through reading his word, hiding that word in our heart so that we won't sin, we need to overcome sin. So not only is there a kingdom of the king, and we've seen the characteristics of the king. Last, I want us to look at the cross of the king. We see this in verse 20. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. It is by the cross that we have reconciliation with God. There's no other plan of salvation. There is no other man of salvation. Jesus is incomparable. There's no one else like him. Why is it so narrow? That's not the question we should ask. We should ask, why would God even give us one way to be saved? We don't deserve it. If we're honest with ourselves, we know the sins that we commit. We know the, every evil deed we've done. We know every idle word that we've thought. And so it is by God's amazing grace that he provided the way 
And it's a beautiful way, it's a perfect way through Jesus Christ. Through the cross, we have the great exchange where Jesus took the punishment for our sins, which we rightly deserved, and he gives us, he imputes his righteousness to us, something we don't deserve, so that we can stand before God holy and blameless. That's what God sees. That's what Jesus will see when he comes and judges us. He died for us. If you will, hold your uh, place. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. It's just the very next chapter. I want us to take a look at this great exchange. Paul tells us, And you who were dead in your trespasses and in this uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in the cross. Jesus did not conquer death and sin in spite of the cross. He conquered through the cross. The cross wasn't plan B, that was plan A. And nobody takes his life from him. He said, I have the power to lay down my life and I have the power to raise it up again. He said, no one takes my life from me. This is the plan, the great exchange, that record of sin that is hostile to us. It's a record. Everything that we've ever done, God knows about. Don't think that God doesn't know about your sin. Your sin will find you out, whether in this life, but for sure in the life to come. But those who are in Christ, that record of sin was nailed to the cross. Jesus took the punishment for our sins. You know, I don't know about you, but whenever I think of this, I think of a courtroom. And Jesus is standing in the seat of the judge. He's the judge, the jury, and the executioner. And one day, everyone will stand before him. Believers stand before him and are receive rewards for their faithfulness. But unbelievers will stand before him in judgment over their sins. For the believers, though, it's as if the judge predict, he, he pronounces the guilty verdict, but then he says, he steps down, and he says, I will take the punishment for you. What judge has ever done that? Nobody. No one. It is unprecedented. Jesus is incomparable. And I want to encourage you this morning. Make Jesus first in your life. Make Jesus the preeminent one. He is already preeminent. All authorities in earth and in heaven have already been placed on him. Those of us who reject that authority are just rebels. And one day, all rebels will be dealt with. But you don't have to just come to Christ because he's some, you know, dictator. He loves you. He loves you so much that he died for you on the cross. When no one else would do that, Jesus does it willingly. And not only does he promise you salvation from your sins, but he promises you everlasting life. But Jesus must be your Lord. If Jesus is not your Lord, he cannot be your Savior. Will you make Jesus your Lord today? Let us bow for a word of prayer. O oh Lord God and Heavenly Father, we bow before you this morning in awe and reverence of you. And we are in awe and reverence of your Son, 
whom you have given authority as king over all creation. Jesus, who commanded the wind and the waves to cease, who has power over nature. Jesus, who created the water, the wine from the water. Jesus, who raises people from the dead. What sort of man is this? He is your son. He is the king of kings. He is the preeminent one over all creation. And Father, I pray this morning that if anyone is listening that does not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they would humbly repent of their sin and trust in him today. Today is the day of salvation. No one is guaranteed another day. I pray that you would save them, redeem them, and make them your own. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.